Friends, as it was uh, mentioned at the beginning of the conference, this year's conference is in a very special year, the year of the celebration of the centenaries, the bicentenary festivities. And this session is set aside to reflect on their importance. The Universal House of Justice commends to our attention that at the heart of these festivities, there must be a concerted effort to convey what it means at the heart of these festivities, there must be a concerted effort to convey a sense of what it means for humanity that these two luminaries rose successively above the horizon of the world. In order to reflect on this effort, it is with utmost joy and endless gratitude that we welcome the next speaker this morning. The joy is not because he has been a long serving the faith as a pioneer in South America, not only because he's been serving the faith in all levels of Baha'i administration for a period of 40 years, including membership to the Universal House of Justice for 22 years when he retired in 2010, not only because of his remarkable ability to create beauty as expressed in his exquisite paintings, but because of also his remarkable scholarship as evidenced by his published work, his insight insightful remarks, and decades of mentoring generation of young adults and awakening a zest for a studying of the text so ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Hooper Dunbar. My goodness, I thought I was coming to a meeting of the Association of Baha'i Studies. And it turns out it's the Association of Baha'i Love. <laughs> really. And shouldn't every Baha'i gathering be that? It's the source of our desire to study and understand. If it weren't for Baha'u'llah, would any of us be in this room? No. So when we think of the, uh, this wonderful bicentenary, commemorating it, celebrating it, let us remember that it all comes from Baha'u'llah, from the soul of Baha'u'llah. It says, uh, as he himself says, that if it was not for him, no divine messenger would have been raised up in this whole universal cycle on this planet. And we had somehow have popped into existence at a very propitious time. We could have been born 250 years ago and not had any part in it at all. And yet we have this bounty of having seen the century of light, having seen the developments of the cause all over the world, having seen a growth in the vision, understanding, and admiration of Baha'u'llah. There were those immediate close friends, the martyrs of the faith, the heroes of the faith, in his own lifetime. But if we had been born at that time, would we have had that opportunity? So in a very special way, standing, sorry, a very special way standing at the 200th year after his birth, we have certain advantages that didn't exist then. We have the vision of a world faith. We have representatives from all the planet, even in this room. We have 
above all the vision of the guardian. 36 years of his ministry enhancing our understanding of Baha'u'llah, of his mission, of his life, of his ministry. That's a terrific advantage that we have, that we want to be sure we're taking advantage of in our own lives, in our own studies, in our own reflections on this period. Before I go on with this, friends, I want to say how much I appreciated the content of the talks that were given, the various sessions since the opening of this conference. And the uh, insights that it's provided us may be reminders in some case, but definitely I felt new insights in the role that the Baha'i community has to play in healing the illnesses in America. And how closely Shoghi Effendi associates this with the success of our own community growth. And it seems to me that we have to, uh, in our own thoughts, uh, think deeply on these matters. It occurs to me that in a sense, in this country, African Americans are on the leading edge of understanding because of their suffering. We know that from the writings. We know that suffering leads to growth. It leads to sensitivity. And we have to make a supreme effort, I think, as a community, both the African Americans amongst us and all the other groups that are here, to carry the faith to these people who have the capacity to reflect it at a depth and with an appreciation that will enhance our own understanding of it. And I hope that the, uh, this re re the response really needs to be at the grassroots level where we're dealing in the neighborhoods, where we're dealing with people of different backgrounds, racial backgrounds. That's happening. Uh, every place that I go where there's junior youth groups, oftentimes they're totally interracial. The Christian church still the most divided moment of the week is Sunday morning. But this is not the Baha'i faith. We have to see this in all of our activities. and We have to enhance it. We don't want it to be a natural process. We want it to be a divine process. We want it something addition. And that will require some focus of attention on the part of all of us. And what a wonderful thing that we could arrive at new understandings and new decisions of service during this bicentennial year. Baha'u'llah has come for all mankind. There's room for every soul, Shoghi Effendi emphasizes in a letter, soul of every type fit into the Baha'i community. And the more it's diverse, the greater it becomes. So let's have a multicolored community everywhere. <laughs> Looking back at the at the vision of the guardian and how he set forth in his glorious writings, particularly and God Passes By, all the things we need to know and think about this bicentennial period. He writes that Baha'u'llah, he who in such dramatic circumstances was made to sustain the overpowering weight of so glorious a mission, was none other than the one whom posterity will acclaim and whom innumerable followers already recognize as the judge, the lawgiver, and redeemer of all mankind, as the organizer of the entire planet, as the unifier of the children of men, as the inaugurator of the long-awaited millennium, 
as the originator of a new universal cycle and as the establisher of the most great peace, as the fountain of the most great justice, as the proclaimer of the coming of age of the entire human race, as the creator of a new world order, and as the inspirer and founder of a world civilization. Further, he goes on, he was formally designated Baha'u'llah, an appellation signifying at once the glory, the light, and the splendor of God, and was styled as the Lord of Lords, the most great name, the ancient beauty, the pen of the Most High, the hidden name, the preserved treasure, he whom God will make manifest, the most great light, the all highest horizon, the most great ocean. More intimately, Shoghi Effendi has described, and we should remember that Shoghi Effendi was never in the physical presence of Baha'u'llah. But he answers a question which we may often be asked, and that is, who was Baha'u'llah? What was Baha'u'llah like? And we all search and we think of so many things we could say, and we wonder how, it, how, it, how we would do it, what would be the most appropriate way. Shoghi Effendi, fortunately, in, in a few brief lines, has described this figure of Baha'u'llah to us. The august figure of Baha'u'llah, he writes, preeminent in holiness, awesome in the majesty of his strength and power, unapproachable in the transcendent brightness of his glory. And again in another parallel passage, the incomparable figure of Baha'u'llah, transcendental in his majesty, serene, awe-inspiring, unapproachably glorious. Friends, he is very close to us. He says he's closer to us than our life vein. He tells us that the emanation from our creator, from the great unknowable God of this vast universe that we are beginning to understand the extent of. He says that that, that, that closeness is actually pouring into us and creating life in us that our life depends on an emanation from our maker and that that emanation has various levels of consciousness and that our soul, our person, is our thought. So we want to think about where our thoughts are. A parenthesis. Whatever form or whatever I am, my words have no authority upon my, except my own understanding of the writings. You know that very well because you're all students, scholars, and you're here for this Association of Baha'i Studies. But yet it's a precious thing if we have the opportunities to share with each other the feelings and the insights that we have. So I welcome this opportunity, but just remember, you have to weigh all this against the writings. It says clearly in the writings, our thought, our soul and thought is coming from the Holy Spirit. If it were not for the Holy Spirit, even though we're not aware of it, we would have no consciousness that everything depends on the light and the heat of the Son of Truth. And we have two parts to ourselves. We have the physical part and we have the spiritual part. And as much as the world tells us that the physical part predominates and is the cause of everything we think and do, Abdu'l-Bahá turns all that on its head and he says it's the spirit is the foundation. The soul with its innate gifts, your innate gifts, your innate talents, brings, calls into being a physical vehicle for itself, according to the laws of God. Creates a body in which it operates. And it continues to reign over that body, over every single cell of that body. And it has a, 
an autonomic, that is, an unconscious area of operation, which is the thing that provides us with saliva and tears and the blood coursing in our veins. So many things, all dependent on the soul's interaction with the body. Now we can abuse the body, as we often do, and then things get out of sorts, so to speak. As we conform ourselves to the teachings and laws and admonitions of the cause, we bring our outer physical activity into conformity with the spiritual birthright that's inherent and standing within us, if you will. In the same way, Abdu'l Baha says that this, this is a, a parallel of understanding with the soul of the manifestation of God, which is a different order of being from humans entirely. Something we weren't all aware of. We thought he's, he's an exalted being. He's a very high being, but this is a different order of existence. This realm of the universal reality, the primal will of the manifestation of God. And that's the spirit that animates the body of existence, the body of humanity. And we're all the individual cells in that body. And just as when we don't obey the laws in our personal individual life, it causes an imbalance and a disturbance and illnesses and problems. So likewise, this universal reality of Baha'u'llah is encompassing all of us. He's at everybody's, the door of everybody's heart. This is a, quite a different picture from what we might imagine, and yet we all are ready to pray to him on any part, in any part of the planet and have immediate access and feel he's our Lord. It's a very interesting order of being that, that for the first time we have more teachings about. So Abdu'l Baha says, as humanity comes into conformity, as it acts on this marvelous principle of free will which we've been given, which is the source of all difficulties and the source of all blessings and goodness at the same time. And Shoghi Effendi and Abdu'l Baha before him say this is a mystery, the mystery of free will. Why do we have free will? Why didn't God make everything perfect? It could all run well. He certainly has the authority, majesty, power, wisdom, but he doesn't. He puts it in our hands while we're in this realm of existence to choose. And that choosing, friends, is every instant of our lives. It isn't one time I chose to be a Baha'i and that's the end of it. It's every morning we wake up, are we disgruntled with our spouse or are we going to be pleasant and happy, joyful beings? Every interaction during the day is casting the balance of whether we're moving towards the will of God, encompassing the will of God, or exercising our own lower nature. And a bit in contrast to some of the present day theories of science, Baha'u'llah says in a passage that Shoghi, Shoghi Fendi is included in the gleanings, he says that all good comes from God, and all evil from your own selves. All right? Stand that on its head. No good comes from you. All good comes from God. Anything you manage to do good is because you have turned towards that goodness. You've turned towards that, and you're used as an instrument. Oh my goodness, people say, how many years have you served the cause? Well, that's fine. I could say, count up all the years. What's that mean? But then a tablet of Abdu'l Baha at one stroke takes it all away. He says, the service of the friends belongs to God, not to them. Praise be God if we get to be an instrument, if he plays on our flute or our, our hollow reed, if it can get hollow. But it belongs to him, and we give praise to him for it. And if we think that we have managed to do anything along the way, just the slightest alloy, he says, of self-esteem, self-love, 
and all comes to naught. Tablet of Abdu'l-Bahai says, all your services come to naught. So this is something to remember, but think of the power of his confirmations. I think this is the thing recognizing Baha'u'llah now at this bicentennial time is to take these thoughts into our nature. Our consciousness needs to be enriched, enhanced. And this takes place through the rehearsal, the reading, the reciting of the verses of God. He makes this image of the fact that <clears throat> the energies, the light, the glory of Baha'u'llah, which have emanated from the person of Baha'u'llah, hmm, have been infused into the whole creation. During that time of the heroic age of the faith, Followed, that's followed then by Abdul Baha's working at the diffusion of that light all over the face of the earth. And that's what the Baha'is and under the guardianship and so on and the House of Justice have been carrying this light to all the areas of the world. So we have the infusion of the, of the divine light and then we have the diffusion of the divine light. And now as also indicated, hinted at by the guardian, we have the suffusion of divine light, which is the penetration of that light into the life of society itself, into the individuals. Over the top with the horizon breaks the morning light of, of diffusion. But now that light has to rise. The sun of the revelation is rising and it's penetrating. And where is it penetrating? Hopefully into us and also into neighborhoods. You say, well, what's the emphasis on neighborhoods? Well, that's the basis of mankind at the moment. So, this light is renewed in us and maintained and sustained in our existence by our study of the verses of God, by our reading the writings of Baha'u'llah. I've seen some letters from Shoghi Effendi to new believers. He says, he hopes you will use your leisure time for an intense study of the words of Baha'u'llah, the writings of Baha'u'llah. And in one of those, to, a, to one gentleman, he says, he hopes you will find several hours a day to dedicate to studying the writings of Baha'u'llah, as this is the basis of your spiritual uh, development and service to the cause. I don't know how many times in my life I've done that for several hours a day. I get excited about the concept and I start now at this age and I manage to get into about 10 minutes before I get sleepy. <laughs> but think of it, friends, if we gave that amount of attention to the words of God, and it's not easy, it will bore us at the beginning, we will find it's tedious because you need to absorb the concepts of it. This is why he says we have to read and reread the writings. We can't just read it once. Nobody can do the Agon. Shoghi Effendi said the Americans think they can do the Agon, but it's just, it has to be read and reread. If you look at the marvelous compilation the House of Justice prepared on deepening our knowledge of Baha'u'llah, you derive from that, I think, uh, a, a series of steps First is that we should read the literature, we should read the writings. Then we should reread the writings. Then we should delve consciously into the writings. Then he said we should digest their content. And in some places he said digest the content of each detail of these holy books. And then he goes on beyond that, he says to certain passages, he says we should master them so that we can give them in their proper form, speak out and use, use them in our teaching to others. And in our teaching, speaking to our own selves, in our meditations, we have some content for our meditations besides our navels. <laughs> then he goes beyond that. Now we've gotten to the digest and master. Then he says, memorize characteristic passages, make them your own. 
Shoghi Effendi sent the hand of the cause, Zekr to the summer schools in 1957. And he was sitting with the youth and he said, I encourage you to memorize the, the writings. So some, some of us brave ones said, what did he suggest? He said, well, be good to start with the Egon. He didn't know who he was speaking to. Western youth, we just about died. We finally got it whittled down to the Tablet of Carmel. And some of us learned that for a few weeks. In, in Iran, of course, they had capacity. The, the students that wanted to approach theological studies had to memorize the Quran entirely by the time they were 14 in Arabic, which wasn't their language. It isn't, it isn't beyond human capacity. It's that we've decided that that doesn't work for us. I, well, I'm not good at memorization. Of course you're not good at memorization. It takes practice. It takes effort. It takes rehearsal, you know. I know, I, I always said I didn't want to play tennis. It took me till I was 45 to find out that you could take lessons and, and it was actually a way to do it. So we have these stages. Think of those. How far have we gone with the various books? We have the Guardian's translations. We have the Guardian's translations which outstrip and surpass all the other translations we have of the writings. To the pilgrims he said, you know, quietly one time he said, you read my translations, you can trust them. Why? Because he knew the mind, we're told he knew the mind of Abdul Baha. He knew the mind of Baha'u'llah. He knew what their intention was. So it would get reflected. Sometimes the verses, as you look at his translations, you can't find that exact phrase in that way. It's changed. Or there's, there was some kind of cultural example given that we don't have in the other culture. The other culture needs another expression. The apple of mine eye. We didn't have that in, in Farsi. They didn't have that. I'm going to interrupt just for a second to say something that I wanted to with regard to art. In Haifa, we put together a compilation on science and art. And as you examine the original writings, you find that science is knowledge and art is application or technology. Abdul Baha calls it dentistry art. Abdul Baha calls agriculture art. If you think of this phrase, the wonderful phrase that you put, the artist is the source of everything, in a little broader context, it doesn't eliminate the fine arts. The fine arts are right there. He talks about the painter with the brush. But it, it does extend. So if you don't happen to be good at painting or sculpture or modern dance, don't despair. Go on with your services to mankind through application of science, through the application of knowledge. Okay, sorry to interrupt with that, but I think it's an interesting point for us to bear in mind. There's a list of Abdu Baha, what he calls arts. It just about includes everything that you could do in the world. So now we find that as we turn to these writings, as we turn to these verses, as we study them, Shoghi Effendi talks about, for example, when he's referring to economics. We don't have a full program of economics in the Baha'i teachings. He says it will take time while the principles, the economic principles of Baha'u'llah crystallize in the minds of individuals. Think about that. The verses and teachings of the writings that we're reading of Baha'u'llah crystallize in consciousness. You know what? Before things, before anything crystallizes, it's usually a murk, a mess, like our consciousness, basically. But the more we absorb these verses of God, they crystallize in our minds. And what do crystals do? They reflect, they refract. They enable us 
to move one step closer to Abdu Baha who says we should become the incarnation of light. We should become the embodiment of light to teach the cause. We're, our being should radiate. Our being is our, is our thought. If our thought is filled with the truths of the divine revelation, we have a terrific advantage in any situation to talk about the cause. We've kind of, uh, it gets easier if we think, you know, well, the Holy Spirit will inspire me. The Holy Spirit is in a quandary how to get truths into your head if you haven't studied the writings, if you haven't absorbed them. Yes, he can make you shine with love and sweetness, that's fine. <clears throat> All of us can proclaim the cause of God, and we're called upon to do that, every individual. And there's no footnote there that says you should be young and handsome or beautiful or highly brilliant in your field or it's just everybody. The duty of every individual is to proclaim the cause of God. And you say to yourself, what could that possibly be? And in one passage he says, and after you proclaim the cause of God, if anyone shows interest, teach them. Oh. Proclamation is not the same as teaching. Shoghi Effendi says we should let everyone know and I think when we're talking about Herculean effort, that's very closely connected to this. Let them know the name of Baha'u'llah and that the, he's brought a faith that can solve the problems of mankind. I remember as a new Baha'i, the, uh, the friend said, Abdu Baha said, if you're going to meet a person once, proclaim the message, give the message to them. If you're going to see them more than once, live the life. The guy moves into somebody in your apartment, in your apartment just down the hall, and the first time you see him, have you heard of Baha'u'llah? No, it may be a bit, you know, too much in his face. <laughs> Show some kindness first. But with the guy on the bus, or the lady on the bus, you know, if you can find a way to mention or to start a conversation, and bring the name of Baha'u'llah and Baha'i, Shoghi Effendi says there's a latent capacity in the soul to recognize that, even though they don't know what it's connected to. They may say it's strange, but they're not going to be able to forget it. And how many times we meet people that say, I'd never heard of the faith until last year, and now I've heard of it three times. It's, it, it comes back into people, but they just haven't noticed, and now it starts building in them. Oh, well, finally, what is this? You know, my cousin's neighbor is a Baha'i, and I saw an advertising in the paper that sounded interesting, and then I met somebody on the train, and they told me about the Baha'i faith. Sometimes it takes uh, multiple stages, but it's really, if we can find a way to leave no one that we meet and have contact with unaware that such a thing exists. And this, this can be very simple, in fact, the fact that have, sometimes somebody says, I said, where are you from? They say, oh, I'm from Cleveland. Oh, Cleveland. Do you know the Baha'is in Cleveland? The who? The Baha'is, you know, the followers of Baha'u'llah's message, it's brought this terrific message to unite mankind and to solve the problems of the world. Have you not heard of it? <laughs> uh, yeah. Along the same line, let us not lose sight of the dawnbreakers. The dawnbreakers, the dawnbreakers, and the dawnbreakers, the book. <laughs> and from the book, you'll get the picture of the other, the other dawnbreakers. Shoghi Effendi, when he, after spending eight months working on this book, night and day, at a time when every other need of the cause was crying, he sent it off to America and wrote this message. He says, feel impelled, appeal entire body American believers. Henceforth, regard Nabil's soul-stirring narrative as essential adjunct to the reconstructed teaching program, as unchallengeable textbook in their summer schools, as source of inspiration in all literary artistic pursuits as an invaluable companion in times of leisure, as indispensable preliminary to future pilgrimage, Baha'u'llah's native land, and finally, 
as an unfailing instrument to allay distress and resist attacks of critical disillusioned humanity. Have we all absorbed this? Have we approached the content of Nabil's narrative in the past or recently? It seems to me we'll henceforth regard it and as being essential with our teaching work that we really want to know about it. And Shoghi Fendi in other letters, he says how that sustains and lifts our souls, these episodes, and how the youth particularly should memorize the details of them to be able to recount them to themselves and to others. It's, it's, it's not something you want to slip off your agenda. Friends, now you will find uh, that we're dealing with two levels of responsibility here. There's, and it's almost as if they're two covenantal levels as well. One is we have embraced Baha'u'llah and we have to obey Baha'u'llah. And he has given us obligatory prayers and fasting and told us to immerse ourselves in the ocean of his revelation and meditate on its contents, absorb and meditate on its contents. All of that's part of our individual covenant of accepting Baha'u'llah. Then we have the institutions of the faith which are guiding us in collective responsibilities. So we have individual activities and we have collective activities. We want to be sure, friends, that the collective activities are animated and driven by the energy we derive from our individual activities, which is our own prayer and meditation and study, so that the action will be effective, so that we won't heal as we do occasionally. Baha'i is saying, oh, I'm so tired. I've been through so many cycles of growth. I don't know if I can live through another one. Well, this is not, this is because the individual part of it is not being fulfilled properly, which fills us with the energy, which gives us all the element to be able to move forward properly. So we should, we should have that in mind also, I think, in our individual programs of study, which are mentioned, by the way, as you'll recall, in a number of the Ruhi books, that the individual should have a program of study of the writings of the faith. The House of Justice never intended that we should lessen that part of our activity by prescribing collective activities where we act in groups and we have programs and cycles of growth and things. All of that is meant to be wed with the other. So the House of Justice, somebody will tell you, hasn't mentioned Dawnbreaker, so it's not part of the plan, so don't worry about it. I don't think the House of Justice would agree with that point of view because it's in the writings and in the admonitions of the guardian to do it the other way. So they're never going to be able to say that. As far as people say, oh, the House of Justice doesn't favor firesides or study classes. Ridiculous. I met with the House of Justice last September. They said, we've mentioned firesides more times in our messages now than any time in the previous 30 years. Do you get the message, friends? The House of Justice is sitting on top of the revelation and the guidance of the guardian. That's wh where it all comes from. It isn't to be left behind in some way. God help us. The guardian stands in the center of the House of Justice forever and ever. Memberships come, memberships go, memberships come. The, guardian, the guardianship is standing in the center of it. That's the protection of the House. It's incorporated in their constitution. Everything comes from there. We should not be lax in our understanding of Shoghi Effendi's writings. It will form also our consciousness. It will help us to direct the refraction from the crystallization of studying the divine texts. It will help us to direct those energies the right way and to balance in our lives. Sacrifice. Let that be the theme of the bicentennial year. Sacrifice. Shoghi Effendi, in a letter, describes sacrifice for the friends. He said, sacrifice is in three areas. The first area, he said, is financial. 
is making sacrifices, feeling the hurt of giving, in a sense, but also being willing and longing to do it, but also recognizing it. If we have a lot of money, the sacrifice is more severe in the sense that we have to make an effort to sacrifice. Otherwise, we can give more than anybody else in the community and not have even bothered ourselves with it. So this is a question of conscience in the individual. Nobody can tell us what we should do or tell others what they should do. But this financial sacrifice is a measure of faith, Shavi Fendi says, in one place. Interesting. And regularity is obviously very important in this. Now the cause is growing in wealth. The friends are paying the hukuk. This is enabling the House of Justice to take initiatives that it was not able to take in earlier decades. Second area of sacrifice. Can you guess what it is or do you know? Time. You have to sacrifice your time to the service of the cause. We all have full lives. We can all find out what to do every vacation, every evening of our lives, every, every everything. But we have to measure to see how much of that we can give to the faith. And of course, these are sacrifices that in the end are not sacrifices. They become blessings. They, you realize as in the action of them that they attract divine bounties to you. You give money and it comes back to you. I'm trying to keep giving it away and it gets more and more. What's going on here, you know? Time, the same thing. Well, I have to have time for this, I have to have time for that, yes. That comes to the third element of sacrifice that he speaks about, person. You have to sacrifice your person. That is, sacrifice the goals as a human in society that you've set for yourselves. Some of those have to be curtailed because that affects both your finance and your time. I have a vision of myself with my triple doctorate and I don't know what all. Maybe I'm going to have to think about that. Maybe I'm going to have to leave, leave some of my education to Baha'u'llah. And then everything I've studied will become meaningful because I use my time and my person to promote the cause. These are, these seem to me, these are bicentennial themes that we want to think about. Shoghi Effendi gives us a glorious vision of Baha'u'llah's life and then of his ministry. The life, he divides it into four stages. I wanted to share that with you. He says with the, the first stage, with the birth of Baha'u'llah may be said to have begun the first 27 years of a life which were characterized by the carefree enjoyment of all the advantages conferred by high birth and riches and by an unfailing solicitude for the interests of the poor, the sick, and the downtrodden. It was a very high situation that Baha'u'llah enjoyed with his father as a minister in the government and so on. The marriage of Baha'u'llah, have you seen the detail where to carry the bounties and gifts uh, uh, of the wedding, after the wedding to Nawab, they needed 50 donkeys. Now we have some pretty extravagant weddings around here, but I don't think we've had anything that needs 50 donkeys to carry the gifts back. <laughs> this is a, 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 it was a privileged situation, very privileged situation. Yet, there's some note here, let's see if I can find it, sorry. Anyway, Baha'u'llah, Shoghi Fendi says, beside that, of course, he disdained all those privileges in a sense. He was constantly helping the poor and, and uh, helping society until the moment came when he received the message of the Bab through Mullah Hussein who shared with him 
some of the first writings of the Bab from the Kayumalasma. And then that begins a period of nine years, and this is stage two, nine years of active and exemplary discipleship in the service of the Bab. Imagine the supreme manifestation of God, he's serving as a disciple for his forerunner. Very interesting development here. Shoghi Effendi describes it as follows. A fire from the very beginning with an uncontrollable enthusiasm for the cause he had espoused. Conspicuously fearless in his advocacy of the rights of the downtrodden. In the full bloom of youth, immensely resourceful, matchless in his eloquence, endowed with inexhaustible energy and penetrating judgment, possessed of the riches and enjoying in full measure the esteem, power, and prestige associated with an enviably high and noble position, and yet contemptuous of all earthly pomp, rewards, vanities, and possessions. Closely associated on the one hand through his regular correspondence with the author of the faith he had arisen to champion, and intimately acquainted on the other with the hopes and fears, the plans and activities of its leading exponents. Think of the involvement of Baha'u'llah in the conference of Badasht, for example, or in support of the defenders of Sheikh Tabarsi, the fortress at Sheikh Tabarsi. At one time advancing openly and assuming a position of acknowledged leadership in the forefront of the forces struggling for that faith's emancipation. At another, deliberately drawing back with consummate discretion in order to remedy with greater efficacy an awkward or dangerous situation. At all times vigilant, ready, indefatigable in his exertions to preserve the integrity of that faith, to resolve its problems, to plead its cause, to galvanize its followers, and confound its antagonists. Then Baha'u'llah, because of the position at the center of the stage so tragically vacated by the Bab because of his martyrdom, as a cause of its martyrdom, Baha'u'llah now assumes a role at the center of the cause completely and enters the third stage, which is four months long, 27 years, nine years, and now four months, this third stage. Think of the vitality of that. The fulfillment of all the prophecies of the year nine. The entrance into the mortal peril, if you will, of the Sia Chal. And finally, by an imprisonment of four months duration, overshadowed throughout by mortal peril, embittered by agonizing sorrows, and immortalized as it drew to a close by the sudden eruption of the forces released by an overpowering, soul-revolutionizing revelation. A dynamic process, divinely propelled, possessed of undreamt-of potentialities, world-embracing in scope, world-transforming, acquired a tremendous momentum with the first intimations of Baha'u'llah's dawning revelation amidst the darkness of the Sayyid Chal of Tehran. It was in that year, in those, that time, while the Blessed Beauty lay in chains and fetters in that dark and pestilential pit, the breezes of the All-Glorious, as he himself described it, were wafted over him. There, whilst his neck was weighted down by the Garagohar, his feet in stocks, Breathing the fetid air of the Sayyid Chal, he dreamed his dream and heard on every side exalted words, and his tongue recited words that no man could bear to hear. Released from the Sayyid Chal through the provisions of divine providence, he enters upon the fourth and last stage of his life. And this is a 39 or 40 year ministry. And Shoghi Effendi divides that, parses that into different parts and emphasis and so on. Uh, this, this simplest, we can't go into all the details of that, but the simplest summary you'll find of major events is the intimation of his mission in 1853, the declaration of his mission 
in 1863, the proclamation of his mission in 1867-68 to the kings and ecclesiastical leaders of mankind. And finally, the consummation of his mission with the revelation of the Kitabi Akdas and the tablets that flowed out after that. And the whole, this whole process of the dawning of the Son of Truth in Shiraz and the daybreak of it in Tehran and the full splendor of it in Adrianople and the afternoon warming sunlight of the final stages of revelation the Son of Truth sets in 1892. This is, it's, it's so good to have these kind of uh, pictures of the stages of things. Then you can go and fill in the details and put them where they need to be when you're reading different historic accounts. You can know what, right where everything fits. With the ascension of Baha'u'llah, his spirit winged its flight to his other dominions. And I wanted to quote something from the Guardian uh, he's reminding us of Abdu'l Baha, the, what he said about after Baha'u'llah's passing, what this meant for the spirit of Baha'u'llah. And I think this directly relates now to the, to the time that we're in and to this celebration uh, that we're passing through at this period. So, Abdu'l-Baha, as the authorized interpreter of his teachings, had himself later explained that the dissolution of the tabernacle wherein the soul of the manifestation of God had chosen temporarily to abide signalized its release from the restrictions which an earthly life had of necessity imposed upon it. Its influence no longer circumscribed by any physical limitations. Its radiance no longer be clouded by its human temple. That soul could henceforth energize the whole world to a degree unapproached at any stage in the course of its existence on this planet. We're not Johnny come lately, friends. We're in the full splendor of this growing sun of truth that's rising by a progressive revelation, another form of progressive revelation. It's the progressive revelation of the energies inherent in the words and revelation of Baha'u'llah gradually dawning on the world and bringing us to the consummation of the most great peace, the world commonwealth, and this divine civilization that the House of Justice continually reminds us is, is ahead of us. We don't, we don't realize how important the, our little movements are to that to that consolidation. Let us uh, reflect on these words of Baha'u'llah, again related to proclamation in the sense that I think that we talked about. Baha'u'llah says, unloose your tongues and proclaim unceasingly his cause. This is better for you than all the treasures of the past and of the future, if ye be of them that comprehend this truth. Thank you, friends. I'm sure I speak for everyone in thanking Mr. Dunbar from the bottom of our hearts for inspiring us this morning, for elevating our understanding, and identifying some themes for our consideration and reflection in this special year of the bicentenary festivities. Thank you, Mr. Dunbar.